everyone, welcome to Build. We are live from London right now, and we are so lucky to be joined by the legendary David Rodigan, MBE. Make some noise, show him some signal. <laughs> Hello, David, welcome to Build. How are you? Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you. It's very wonderful to have you. Um, now, before we get started, if you're watching live online and you have a question for David, then you can send them in on Twitter or on Facebook. We are at Build Series LDN. So send them our way, and then we'll do our very best to get them answered at the end of the show. So, David, congratulations uh, on the epic release of your autobiography, My Life in Reggae. Now, this is something that the reggae world has been yearning for for quite some time, um, and obviously the reggae industry would not be where it is today without you, so thank you, and thank you for releasing this book. I know that uh, a, lot of a lot of people have been asking you to put out a book, right? Yes, um, over the years, and my slightly coy reply was, if Keith Richards hasn't written a book, why should I? And um, being a fan of the Stones, and um, then he did, and then people said, well, he did, why don't you? Well, I genuinely didn't think there would be interest beyond reggae people. Um, when there's nothing wrong with that, of course. But I felt that it would be difficult to get a publisher, and it wouldn't generate a lot of interest, and I, and I really believe that. But in fact, it was um, a telling that I received from Damien Marley three years ago after a the Notting Hill Carnival. We were doing an after party um, in Hoxton, and uh, we were, but he was about to go on stage, and I was about to introduce him. And he turned to me and he said, um, where's the book? And I said, what do you mean? He said, you need to write a book. Uh, you knew my father. You've been in this business a long, long time. Um, we need the stories to be written down. There needs to be history here. There is history, and you need to write it. And his manager was there, Dan Dalton, and he was going, I told you. Um, and um, I, 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 that night when I went home, I thought about it. And then I'm Ian Burrell, who is a journalist whose work I've always admired as media correspondent for The Independent across the years, who had interviewed me on a couple of occasions. He had said, I will do a, take a sabbatical to write this book with you. So I figured, you know what? Um, I'm approaching, well, this is two years ago, um, 65, so maybe I should write this down, so we did. So you started writing it two years ago. Yes. How did you find that whole experience of, of revisiting such specific details? Well, it was amazing, actually, because it was actually really easy. People say to me, how can you write a book? How, I mean, how do you remember it, or do you refer to diaries? And I never referred to a diary once. I've never kept a diary, but I remember all these things. They never left me. So apparently, you know, some people can remember the specific things and some people can't. Uh, ask me what I did last week, I'll tell you I couldn't remember, but ask me what I did in the summer of 67 and I'll tell you exactly what I did. I can remember all the specific moments in my life um, that were exciting and new and, and fresh, and I can particularly remember all the things associated with this music because I became really true, really and truly addicted to this music by the time I was 16. I, I, I had literally, there's no exaggeration, fallen in an obsessive way in love with this culture and this music. And, and I was really a, a, a rather a lonely person because I hardly knew anyone who had my love for it because I, and I was living in a small village in, in Oxfordshire. It wasn't a Jamaican community, so it was... Um, it was a strange experience in many ways because, um, you know, people, I mean, in 67, yes, other mods were into it. And then when it changed to Rocksteady, they kind of left it behind. And, and then, you know, um, a, a number of my friends would say to me, you still like that stuff? And I'm like, yep, I still do. And it all changed, of course, when the Whalers released Catch a Fire. And then the whole genre became very popular with the rock intelligentsia, so to speak. And, the, the, the music press started endorsing it, and it developed a whole new genre in terms of how it was received and recognized by the media. And you, you talked about, you know, being so passionate about music from a very, very young age. But can you remember the time or the, the specific moment, talking of remembering <laughs> small details, when you realized that, yeah, your passion is not only going to become your career, but your, your life? Like, can you remember where you were or what you were doing when you were like, wow, this is where I'm supposed to be? 
Not really. I just knew that I loved the music, and, and as a passionate collector, uh, the, the, the business of being a broadcaster was actually accidental. All I wanted to do was be in the Royal Shakespeare Company. That was my ambition. I'd studied theatre, and that's what I wanted to do. I had this hobby, this uh, obsession of collecting the records, and it was actually a, an actress girlfriend who I was living with at the time who suggested that I apply for a job on Radio London because they had announced that we're looking for new presenters, and I said, well, I'll, I'll never get that. She actually wrote a letter on my behalf, and she got me the audition, and uh, to cut a long story short, I passed the audition. But until that moment in time, I had never conceived of myself being anything more than what millions of other people are worldwide, whether it's jazz or books or pieces of art, people who are passionate about something. And that is everything, because passion comes from all walks of life and it comes in all sources and passion gives us joy, it gives us solace. It's a way to retreat, it's a way to find um, joy and happiness outside of the often tedious lives in which we all have to live in many respects because we're forced to perhaps do things that we actually don't want to do to earn a living. And so many people live, you know, bird watching, whatever it is, a passion. And that's what this was for me, it was just quite simply that. And I, and I, I took great pride in it. I had a, 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 a I, and I still have a fabulous collection of records, and I would take great comfort from listening to these songs in various moods and in various styles. So this whole business of sitting here today and being a broadcaster was really a, a, a matter of coincidence in that I was given the opportunity to do something, and actually in the audition they stopped it after 10 minutes and said, um, actually, thank you for coming down, but you're the wrong color. We're looking for a black presenter. And, and that was in 1978, and I completely understood that, of course, because, uh, well, why not? And uh, it was, what they actually did was they played the audition tape to black record producers and West Indians who were involved in the industry. And, uh, and the story I was told was that they'd all said, yeah, whoever this guy is, you should, you should use him. And, and of course, for a year and a half, the, no one knew I was white until I walked on stage at the, um, at the Apollo Club in Wilsdon, and there was a deafening silence. Uh, after there'd been an almighty cheer, a bit like the, today when I came on, there was an almighty cheer. Yes, here's David Rodigan, the man you've been listening to on Capital Radio, Radio London. Rain! And I walked out and it Russ! You know, it was like hundreds of black people going, it's white. Uh, and then I, the MC nudged me and said, you're going to get a Jamaican shower of bottles in a minute if you don't say something. So I started to speak, and I actually saw some people in the front row closing their eyes, listening to my voice. And then I signed on with a jingle at the Apollo Club in Wilsdon. And uh, that was my baptism of fire into being a, a live club DJ as opposed to a DJ playing records on the radio. And you won everybody over. Uh, yeah, it would seem so. Um, yes, uh, I have to say, you know, publicly that the love that's been given to me by West Indians and particularly by Jamaicans on the island of Jamaica has been something to behold, you know. Joy springs eternal um, when you have that kind of love. When you go to a place where you're not born there, you, you, you've, you've not been reared there, and yet you're given the kind of welcome that I've been given over the years, whether it's you know the Spanish Town Road, whether it's Waterhouse, Tower Hill, uh, Maxfield Park, um, I've never had to live in fear in Jamaica, at ever, at ever, what, not once in my entire life. I did get a gun salute, which gave me a fright um, <laughs> at a dance, and it was an off-duty policeman, so everyone said, legal, because it was an off-duty policeman doing it as opposed to a gangster, but there you go. I mean, that is when you made it, right? Yeah, <laughs> I guess so. Uh, it, it, I've, I've had, I really have been given so much love by the people of Jamaica, um, and, I, and I know it's simply because I'm as passionate about their music as they are, and, uh, and I take great joy in sharing it with people. Yeah, it's very well deserved. And now I'm reading the book right now, very much enjoying it, obviously. Um, and I just love how you come in straight away, chapter one, page one, bam, and you talk about meeting potentially one of the most important artists that have ever stepped foot on this planet. So for anybody who maybe hasn't read it yet, could you maybe share that story with us? Yeah, it was a remarkable coincidence, and, and I was very, very fortunate. It was the first show that Bob Marley and the Whalers ever did in England um, as the Whalers, and it was at a pub on Fulham Palace Road called The Greyhound, and it was a hot summer's night in 1974, and I was there. Um, as were hundreds of others, literally, you, the people hanging off the roof, it was incredible. And you didn't see them, you just heard them, and it was... 
and this drum beat, and we're all, you know, and they were squatting on a stage not much higher than this, and they were beating drums, and they started to sing the Rastaman chant. I hear the voice of the Rastaman say, and the place erupted, and I'm shivering now just remembering it, and then they stood up, and there was Bunny with a red fez on, and Peter with a tam on, and Bob in a red and black lumberjack's jacket, and then Carlton Barrett hit the rim shots, and the family man came in the bass, and then Y. Lindo started, and it was the Whalers, and it was just the most incredible concert. It was actually better than the, than the records. It was, for me, it was exhilarating, and I left, I was walking down Fulham Palace Road, and I saw this enormous cloud of smoke coming out of a shop doorway. And I literally thought the shop was on fire because anyone familiar with the, uh, with the idea of blazing you know what uh, will be aware of the fact that when somebody exhales, it is considerable. Um, and there was a lot of smoke. And when it cleared, there was Bob Marley on the end of one with uh, Wire Lindo, and I just couldn't believe it. They were in a shop doorway about 200 yards down from the pub. And um, I didn't know what to do, and my girlfriend said, no, go, just, go and, just go and talk to them. And I walked over, and I sort of gushed, you know, I was like, how long I've waited for this, you know, the album, the burning album's brilliant, and he looked at me, he <laughs> this guy's a, a bit of a nut, you know. Um, and he, was, he shook my hand, and, and then this car screeched to a halt, and uh, he's, he, he said, I'm going. So they got into the car, and as the car pulled away on Fulham Palace Road, I stood there, and he turned, and he waved to me from the back window of that car, and I will never forget that moment as long as I live. And that was the, the time I first met Bob Marley. And did you just wave, just wave back? Yeah, of course I waved back, yeah. <laughs> just pardon him. No one would believe me, but... but uh, <laughs> you have been a part of so many historic moments in reggae, and everybody knows Rodigan is king of the sound clash. So I know you've been involved in so many, but looking back, can you sort of pinpoint one that you will never forget? And whether that is because it didn't go so well or whether it was just so fantastic, one that really stands out. Yeah, I think um, probably the most famous one is, is the Jaro Clash in New York. It was a rematch, and they were my nemesis and my adversaries in more ways than one. And Ricky Trooper was, and still is, one of the most inspired selectors. And Kilimanjaro is, without doubt, one of the great Jamaican heavyweights of sound system culture. Um, they've got dub plates that other sound boys would literally die for. Um, and I clashed with them in 93 in, 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 in Miami. And that was an, an almighty clash. There was a rematch in Long Island, or Strong Island, as they call it, in 97. And that was truly phenomenal. I mean, um, it was a battle, uh, and it went on for hours, because there was nobody else. It was just me versus them. And it was utterly relentless. Um, so I'll never forget that one. And I guess the other one I'd, I, I really have to mention is the one with Barry Gordon, who was my radio equivalent in Jamaica. And we did a clash in 1985 in Brooklyn, at the Brooklyn Empire. And that was the, the days of cassette and tape. We, we live in a media world now where everything is instant. In those days, cassette and tape carried the swing, and cassettes were passed around as a form of, of, uh, you know, of, of exchange. And these cassettes had reached New York, and the promoter, um, actually flew from New York to London to book me. I and mean, he was waiting for me at Capital Radio. I said, what's this guy doing? He said, oh, he's just come in from New York. And he said, I'm, 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 my name's Juki. I'm fr I've flown in from New York for one reason, to book you, name your price now. And he had some dollars on and gave me a deposit. Got back on the plane, and Barry G flew up from Jamaica. And, um, and that was it. We did that clash that night. And there were th it was incredible, because when we arrived, we were very nervous, because we didn't realize it was such a big event, because we saw these people four, four deep off, the, off this wall around the building. And we said, what's going on here, some sort of concert? And he said, no, no it's for you. They, they want, they've come to see you and Barry G. And it, we were so nervous, both of us, I could hardly queue up the dub plates. And that was, uh, that was a phenomenal night in 1985, yeah. That does sound phenomenal. Um, and obviously, there's a lot of elements to a sound clash. One of the very important elements is the dub plate. 
What was the first dub plate that you ever had cut? Well, the first dub plate I cut, remember that there are two types of dub plate. There's a dub plate which is an exclusive recording, then there's a personalized dub plate with your name in it. The first dub plate I cut in Jamaica was uh, Love in Unity by Michael Prophet. It was mixed by King Tubby himself, and Jammy was there. And that was in 1979, my first trip to Jamaica. And then uh, a little bit later on, about a year after that, I started being given dub plates, which were glorified jingles, long jingles uh, by various artists, and that's where the whole dub plate culture thing kicked in with other sound systems. So in a sound clash, you have to have your name in a dub plate, otherwise um, you're disqualified. So it's another, it's a bizarre culture, but it is another culture. Okay, so which dub plate would you say has done the most damage? Has got the biggest crowd reaction and like shook your components so much? Um, probably Ring the Alarm by Tenor Saw is a big <laughs> dub. Um, yeah, I guess that one, yeah. Now, as the title of your book suggests, you have lived a whole life in reggae and you've seen the genre grow and evolve and the audiences change. And, you know, as you were saying, dubs were being cut properly back in the day. It was all about cassettes being passed on. And to where we are now, where everything's on MP3s and email and USBs, it must be really fascinating to have seen everything change over the years. Yeah, it's been amazing, but it was more exciting in those days because it was much harder to get stuff. Mm. Now you can literally buy dub plates on the internet and you don't even know if they're real, they could be spliced. It could be, there are the people in Jamaica who make a living from sounding like other people because it's a hustle, you know. I, I've heard dub plates with um, Barrington Levy and, and Bounty Killer on a, on a combination and it's not Bounty Killer and it's not Barrington Levy, but you'd think it was. Um, people are doing impersonations. Um, in those days, it was more challenging because there was so much work involved and there weren't many people doing it. So you could come up with original ideas that no one had thought of. Now a lot of the ideas have been thought of and played out and uh, dubs are very easy to get and they can be spliced and put together and an artist can voice something in New York and something in London. In those days, if you wanted an artist, two artists to voice, they had to be in the same place at the same time and you had to get them there and cut the dub and mix it. And it, Of course, the, the, the nightmare was if it was cut straight to acetate and it wasn't properly mixed, it sounded dreadful, so it was all a waste of time. And I was always very fussy about that and they knew how fussy I was. I really was fussy. I had to sound better than the record, otherwise it couldn't get played. So I was very pedantic about that, but um, it stood me in good test uh, uh, because over the years those dubs can still play. So it was an exhilarating time and it was, I was, you know, it was, I was part of that early sound clash culture um, in that, you know, the idea of playing dub plates with your name in it, which, which followed on from the original concept of a clash, which was merely sound systems outdoing each other with the, the quality of their sound and the exclusivity of rare records. Foundations. Foundations, <laughs> yeah. Um, so what do you make of the reggae industry today? Because you are still extremely influential in it. Um, do you think it's in a good place? A lot of people are saying that there's this whole revival thing happening, whatever you call it, it doesn't need to have a, a label. But yeah, how do you... I think it's in a very it? exciting place. And it's, it, the reason is more than apparent to anyone who knows about pop music. Somebody called Drake is making dance or records. Uh, a lady called Rihanna is making dancehall records. The new Ed Sheeran record is a dancehall beat. What does that say about our culture? It says it is accessible, it is, it is danceable, and it is fun. Um, so I think it's great that other people who are not necessarily part of the culture are making music based on it. There's nothing new about that. The Specials are doing it and Madness are doing it. They were taking sounds and feels and flavors and they were giving it their own interpretation. Um, often much faster than Jamaican ska. <coughs> Excuse me. So I think it's in a healthy position. The thing about reggae, and I think this is, really has to be underlined, is it's always been there and it will never, ever go away. People say, oh, yeah, reggae is done. No, it's, it, it didn't die. You just didn't know what it was doing. It, it, for those who love it, and there are millions of people who do worldwide, um, and I'm sure the people watching this now will will attest to that. This music is never going away. This music preempted drum and bass. It preempted house. It preempted rap. 
Um, this music was the ori uh, the origins of rap music. It was the or it was the origins of the remix. So much emulated from this island, and when you consider that it didn't just emulate from the capital city, it emulated from a small quarter of the capital city, the western region of the capital city of Kingston. And you think of the the number of studios and the prolific output and the number of records that were pressed in those early years that are still revered because they were so magnificent. Then you have to say to yourself. There's nothing, this music is where it is, where it will always be. People who discover it realize that it's an Aladdin's cave when they creak the door open and they realize there's vast volume. Of records are still being released that no one knew about. There's still unearthed tapes that are being discovered. And what we are now seeing, uh, and, and we all know this, is that with artists like Chronix, who's on a two-month tour of America, who did, appeared on the Jimmy Fallon show, and you can see the enthusiasm in Fallon's face and voice. You can hear it when he introduces Chronix. You've got Protégé equally. You've got Dre Island. You've got... Um, I mean, I don't want to start listing people, but there are new young artists in Jamaica with something to say. And when people say to me, oh, I don't understand dance, or I don't know, well, maybe it's not for you. Um, when I discovered music at 16, my dad didn't really get it. Um, if, it, if, it, if, it if you don't understand it, then maybe you just don't get it. Maybe, and that's the thing, you know, there are elements of dance or and, and subject matters which make me cringe, um, and some of it is, is perhaps, well, distasteful, I'd, I'd, I'd use the expression, the adjective, but it has its place within the community with, with which it's talking to. And I think that's what, what we have to remember. It is easy for us to pass judgment on young people making music for themselves. They're not making it for me. They're making it for each other. And, you know, grime, take, take whatever you will. It's being made by the people. And if you, if you don't understand what they're doing, don't interrupt them because they're doing what they want to do. And if you don't understand it, don't stop them doing it because everything has to change, everything has to move on. And that's how things evolve. And if we don't give people the chance, if we're always stuck in, oh, it was different in the old days, yeah, well, you'll soon be dead, mate. So, you know, <laughs> there was a time and we should revere it, but in the same breath, and I'm no spring chicken, I've been around the block a couple of times, but I can hear a hit record and I can also appreciate that something is maybe a little distasteful to me, but I can, I can see why it gets other people really, really up. Because they feel that what it's saying is relevant. And that's what this music, is, this is what this music has always done. This music traditionally has spoken out for the underprivileged. It is spoken out against social injustice. That's why it's revered worldwide. This music speaks volumes for millions of people and always has done. There's a negative element in it, and there's the negative element in everything. But the positive far outweighs the, the negative. And we know what the negative element is in terms of how it's perceived. And, and that's another subject again, because you're looking at Christianity and how that's interpreted in the Old Testament and people's con code of conduct as to the way they should live their lives. You know, we gave Christianity to, to those communities and those communities are turned around and practicing what we told them via preaching that they should do. So that's another element of how music and how culture is perceived by people who are not inside that culture. You're on the outside looking in, you're not in it. Now, I have to ask very quickly, just before we pass over to the audience, um, it's very clear that you and your work are going to continue to grow. So why did you decide to put this autobiography out now? This isn't like a hint that you're going to step back or anything, is it? No, I just figured okay. I had to write it sometime. Ian said he wanted to write it. We sat down together across a year, uh, over a year, and um, we, we, we put it together. And... Um, we titled it according to various genres of the music because we thought that would connect to the music heads. And um, it transpires that it hasn't just sold to music heads, it's sold to people outside of the traditional reggae community. And that's become apparent from sales and, and where it's being sold. So no specific reason other than that um, I was told by Damien Marley I should write it. <laughs> I'd been told by a number of people over the years that I should put my thoughts down and record these things, and, and I did. And, and and I thank everyone for buying it because it, it seems beyond my wildest dreams that it, it, it really is selling and, and it's lovely that it is because it's a story that I've lived through and if it brings people to the music and it gives them a, more of an understanding of the music, then that's a good thing because um, sometimes I think the music is misunderstood. Yeah. 
and maybe we'll get a part two sometime soon. So now it's over to the audience. Um, who is the first question for David? Yeah. Hi, David. Hi. Um, it's cool that your sons are involved in music. Uh, Sorry? It's, it's really cool that your sons are both involved in music. Um, I just wondered if there's any major differences of opinion when it comes to, to music. Uh, no, they, uh, they're younger than me, obviously much younger than me, and have their own views on music, and uh, they're both making music uh, that they want to make. I I'm sure there are, well, I know there are West Indian Jamaican influences in what they're doing, but of course they're reared, born and reared in London, and their influences are, are beyond the traditional... Um, this is the thing about music, that it is forever evolving, forever changing. So the music they're making is, uh, a lot of it's very exciting. And, and I'm, I'm proud of them. I discourage them from doing so. I, I believe you me, I discourage them in every way possible because I warn them that it, it, it may appear glamorous. It may appear, oh, wow, you know, you're in the music business. But as anyone who's in the business knows, it's a very hard life. And there's nothing sweeter than when it's sweet. But when it's sour, it's sour. And it's bitter. And it can be very difficult. And it can upset a lot of people. A lot of people find they can't climb back out of the pit into which they fall. The music business is a very competitive business. And you can be up and you can be hot. And when you're hot, you're hot. And when you're not, you're not. And it's very hard to make a living. In the same way that my father tried to persuade me, dissuade me from working in the theater and warn me of all the uh, pitfalls of, of life as an actor and being able to support a family, I warned my sons um, in, in every po way possible. And um, they pursued their education to the max at university. And then when they came out, they, made, they, they chose a path and um, they, they're, they're plowing their own furrow. Here's the next question. Hi, David. We've got one from Facebook. Um, saw in your interview with Corrupt FM that MC Grinder claims to have invented the rewind. <laughs> if you could have invented any musical motif, what would it be? That was a great interview, by the way. I loved that. He, he, MC Grinder, of course, did invent the rewind. Of course, he did. Um, what, what was the tag to the question? <laughs> if you could have invented any musical motif, what would it be? If I could be remembered. If you could have invented, have invented one. Or, or what would it be? Oh, I see. I beg your pardon. Um, uh, oh gosh, that's a di that's a difficult question. Um, oh, I, I don't know. I can answer that. I, uh, what would it be? Um, Didn't he also say that Bob Marley invented the bass? <laughs> in that yeah, I, I, um, that that's a difficult question. I, I don't know yeah. what I would uh, like to have invented. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm stumbled. I'm, I'm not, I can't answer that question. I don't know how to answer it. It's not that good a question. We've got another one. Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, hey, David. <clears throat> uh, one of my favorite artists of all time is uh, Dennis Brown. And uh, your interview with him in 1984 is just an amazing kind of document uh, towards the culture. I just wondering if you've got any stories or anecdotes around your time with, De uh, with Dennis and also to settle the debate in my household, uh, who's got the better voice between him and Gregory Isaacs? they got two very different voices, and I'm a big fan of both. Uh, Chris Blackwell, who set up Island Records, said that listening to Gregory Isaacs was like listening to the Jamaican Frank Sinatra. I thought it was a good analogy. Gregory's voice was unique, haunting. But for sweetness and sheer magnitude, I think Dennis Brown was the greatest singer. I mean, there are others. Alton is certainly there. But there was something about Dennis Brown's voice from his teenage years, his ability to interpret songs with such a majestic voice and such a depth of understanding that even at the age of 13, when he was writing songs and singing No Man Is an Island and so on, the, the tone of the voice and the expression um, was truly remarkable. And I think that's why he was so revered in Jamaica. His voice was something to behold. He, I mean, the cat, okay, in later years, his voice got affected and it wasn't as good as it had been. But in the, in the golden years, the late, the late 70s, um, when he really was, or well, from 1972 onwards, but at the height of his powers, he was a magnificent singer. And his ability to interpret a song, that was the other thing. And I knew him personally. He was very kind. He was very generous. He was very patient. And he always had time for people. Dennis Brown was dearly loved by Jamaicans. And no artist would ever consider following Dennis Brown onto a stage. None of them. That's why he always closed Sunsplash. 
the, the sun would literally splash across Montego Bay and he would come out and I'm shivering now just remembering it with his locks blowing in the wind and, and the whole thousands of people rising for him because he was a phenomenon. He was, he was very, very special. Um, Bob Marley was a magnificent singer and songwriter and there are others, but voice, interpretation, Dennis Brown, the crown prince. Who has the next question? Hey, David. Um, you're so well known for having an ex extensive library of music, but if you could pick one track to start a party, what would that be? I can't see you. Oh, that's what, what would that be? Oh, gosh. Um, that's a very interesting question. Um, what would that be? Probably Sata Masagana by the Abyssinians, uh, because I've always loved that song. It's so beautiful, it's so haunting. And Bernard Collins has this magnificent vocal and the, the Manning Brothers on harmony. And, and it, it's a very special song. And um, it, whenever I play it, um, it just, you always get a phenomenal response. So um, off the top of my head, I would rapidly, quickly, uh, confidently draw for Sata Masagana by the Abyssinians. Okay, well, thank you so much for your questions. I think that is all we have time for. So I just want to say thank you so much, David. Um, we were talking about career highlights. This has been one for me as well. So thank you. The book is amazing. Um, My Life in Reggae is out right now. I can't recommend it enough. Give it up one more time for Thanks David Rodigan. Yeah.